No, thanks, Chris, and uh, thanks to the organisers, obviously for inviting us, but also for making sure this workshop uh, did actually happen. It was a long time ago when I submitted the abstract for this talk, and a few things have changed since then. So uh, we expected to be at CERN, <clears throat> and everyone would be learning about particle accelerators and hopefully wanting to know more about them. So I thought we'd put in this talk, talk about the history of where we worked and how it interacted with CERN. Hopefully that's still interesting, even though we're now in Amsterdam, of course. Uh, the other thing that's changed is actually I left ISIS uh, in the last two years, and so Sarah has stepped in to give some more up-to-date information and, and talk about the plans for the future. So what we're talking about uh, is ISIS is a neutron source. Um, I'll explain more about what that's for in a while. It's based at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, uh, about 10 miles south of Oxford in the UK. And this is the largest uh, UK central science facility. So it has uh, space science departments, laser facilities, particle physics, high power computing departments, as well as two accelerator based user facilities. So a diamond light source is an uh, electron machine which produces intense X ray beams. And then ISIS, which is a proton accelerator that then produces neutron and some muon beams uh, for, for various research. Um, before we get into the details, um, you know, I'll throw in a slide why do we build and, and run particle accelerators? And it's not just for the, the fundamental research that places like CERN and ISIS do. Um, particle beams are a very powerful tool that can be used to measure and with enough energy even modify all types of matter, you know, down to the atomic level. Um, that's maybe an abstract statement, but it has a wide range of uh, very real, practical, everyday um, applications. Uh, things like medical imaging, seeing inside the body, or even medical treatment, destroying cancers with, with particle beams. Um, energy production and storage. Um, and then industrial processes like sterilization of um, tools or equipment, or even food. Um, also, welding can be done with electron beams. So there's tens of thousands of accelerators all over the world, so some very specialised and practical, and then there are labs like CERN and ISIS where sort of physics research is done. So one physics slide with uh, just the two fundamental concepts that we use to design and operate accelerators. And they are that um, charged particles are accelerated by electric fields. So in the simplest example, you have two plates with opposite voltages, uh, opposite polarities, a voltage across them, and then a charged particle will ex be accelerated one way or the other, depend on its own polarity. Once the particles are moving, if they experience a magnetic field, then they travel on a circular path. So these dots here represent a magnetic field traveling into the page, and yeah, the uh, particles follow a circular path with the radius depending on how strong the field is and how much energy they have. So these are you know, natural phenomena. This doesn't just happen in accelerators. This, this is how particles interact with the world. So you do find particle beams in nature, and lightning is an example of this. A lightning bolt is a high-energy, um, powerful beam of electrons. But of course, uh, I mean, unless you're Marty McFly, it's quite difficult to know where and when these are going to happen. So it's not very useful for research uh, as a research tool. Uh, another source of, a natural source of high-energy particles is naturally occurring radioactive material. Um, radium, for example, emits what we call alpha particles, two protons and two neutrons bound together. Um, so when this decay happens, this particle sees a quite strong electric field due to this big nucleus next to it, and so it's accelerated away. Um, these particles emitted from radium have the equivalent of five million volts of uh, acceleration. So this was enough in 1911, Rutherford, after who's our name? Uh, after who our, na our lab is named? Um, he used these to discover the structure of the atom. He discovered there was a nucleus at the centre and the electrons around the outside. Um, following that, then he started to pursue generating higher energy particles to you know push the research further. So he set up a lab at Cambridge. Um, hired two people called John Cockcroft and Ernest Walton. And they built this uh, voltage multiplier circuit and generated 6 million volts with this, this apparatus here. 
Um, and that was enough. So what they did, they accelerated protons to 6 million volts and bombarded lithium atoms with them, essentially doing this process in reverse. They fired particles into the nucleus, made it unstable, and it split into two alpha particles. So this was the first artificial, you know, man-made splitting of the atom uh, and won them the Nobel Prize. So this, the, these bits of research really kick-started the field of particle accelerators. And then, jumping forward a couple of decades, uh, so that research, you know, was done at a lab at a university. And then the technology, you know, kept pushing for higher energy uh, machines. And so quickly, universities didn't have the space or the resources to build these machines themselves. And that's why around the 50s, and a lot of, around the world, uh, a lot of uh, national laboratories were set up uh, to house these machines. So like the Rutherford High Energy Laboratory, as it was initially called, uh, set up in the UK. So the first project um, for the Rutherford lab was this 50 million volt uh, linear accelerator. So they're being just accelerated in a straight line. I love this photo of the guy smoking a pipe while building a linear. <laughs> you can tell it's the 50. <coughs> the next project was a machine called Nimrod. So this was a 7 gigavolt um, synchrotron. And in a synchrotron, the beam goes round and around in a big circle, getting accelerated higher and higher energy each time it goes round. Uh, this is John Cockcroft, one of the atom splitters, who, who cut the first turf for the project. It's quite large, you know, a lot of construction, building tunnels and, and big hall to house the synchrotron. And this is the machine itself, so very large magnets. You see there's a couple of people here for scale. Very large, heavy machines, which were the state of the art at the time. So Nimrod was a very successful uh, machine in that it exceeded... Uh, its design goals um, and delivered a lot of important research at the time. But almost as soon as it was switched on, the, the, the team realized it wasn't going to be a very long-lasting machine because the technology was, was developing so quickly. Uh, one of the areas where it developed was over at CERN, where they, around the same time, a few years later, they took a risk on building a machine based on a new concept, how to focus the beam in a synchrotron. <clears throat> And this was very successful. It allowed them to build much smaller magnets, so it's a lot cheaper to build. So they could spend the money building a bigger machine. Um, and, and it focused the beam up. I mean, the concept worked, basically. So, so around the same time, compared to Nimrod, they have 15 times as much beam at four times the energy. So that's a, a much broader range of research that could be done. And this machine, just called the Proton Synchrotron, the PS at CERN, is still running today, providing beams for the the Large Hadron Collider and other experiments. But, uh, yeah, so this was a great news for the field of particle accelerators, but quite bad news, really, for Rutherford because their machine was then kind of redundant and um, the money was withdrawn and they had to close it down. So they changed direction at that point and moved away from particle physics and into uh, neutron science. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so, so the budget was quite tight, but uh, they were able to save a lot of money by reusing the LINAC that we saw earlier. They built a new machine, but inside the existing building, um, reusing all the plant services, water and electricity and so on, <coughs> and reused as many magnets and power supplies as possible. Even simple things like the sh shielding is required around an accelerator to keep workers safe, just big blocks of steel and concrete. And reusing those saves a lot of money. In this example here, this is the, the foundation of the neutron-producing target at ISIS, and these shielding blocks are actually sections of the disassembled magnets from Nimrod that we saw earlier. So, good bit of recycling. So the cost overall was about a third of what it would cost to start to build a brand new facility. So I mentioned all this history just as a little bit of the backstory of, of how CERN influenced ISIS, uh, or, or really is responsible for the creation of ISIS and. Uh, you know, there might be a neutron source in the UK today without CERN, but it probably look quite different to, to what we have. Yeah, so today, as I say, CERN is uh, home to the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, I'm sure you've heard of, which um, is the largest, most powerful accelerator in the world. So this accelerates beams to seven terabolts and collides them together, generating particles that we don't see normally in the world around us, they're difficult to measure. ISIS, on the other hand, is, is not the largest or most powerful accelerator in the world. It was once the most powerful neutron source of its type, 
um, but that has been overtaken by new facilities elsewhere in the world. However, it is still one of the most productive accelerator-based research labs uh, because it has a, a user community of over 3,000 scientists and researchers worldwide, mostly UK-based, but, but worldwide, um, who together do 750 or so experiments every year. Um, so they, we don't, to be clear, they don't do like medical treatments or uh, energy production or anything, but they do the research that makes those things possible. I've squeezed in one slide on my, as I said, I left ISIS uh, just over a year ago, and I now work at the European Spallation Source in Sweden. So this is a new um, project. We're building a machine, the next generation of, of neutron facilities like ISIS. Um, so this will... So this is a collaboration of 14 European countries, um, has a budget of 3 billion euros, and is aiming to, to welcome its first users about five years from now. So at the moment, we're just building... Uh, we're building and commissioning the, the initial stages. So this, this section has now been run up and had beam, and this gets us to 20 million volts. Uh, we're trying to get to 2 gigavolts. So. Um, and as you can see, this is taken during the pandemic, and never mind smoking pipes, we weren't even allowed to breathe under each other. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, so we come to the main topic of the talk, and, and really this workshop... Uh, the data acquisition and software requirements of uh, accelerators and analysis in particular. So continuing the, the history talk, um, I'll go through the, the lifetime of ISIS. So back in the 80s when ISIS was new, this beast was the state-of-the-art, these GC mainframe computers, um, and four of these were used to run the whole facility. It's funny they chose a completely unscalable naming convention and called these John, Paul, George and Ringo. <laughs> But of course, so by today's standards, these are very basic machines, which uh, could only handle simple communication between equipment, switch on power supplies and stuff, and uh, did some offline physics calculations. But really, the machine, the accelerator, was um, operated uh, and studied all in analog. The, you know, devices were physically cabled to a control room, um, uh, and analog oscill oscilloscopes used to, to view those traces, and then... Um, you know, you had to use a Polaroid camera and take a picture if you wanted to put something in the logbook. <coughs> Through the 90s, uh, you know, the next, oh, the next generation of, of uh, equipment got installed. So we had a couple of racks of digital oscilloscopes um, and a dedicated PC terminal that could talk to them via serial comms to uh, set them up and retrieve data. And then there were some Fortran and C libraries that could could analyze that data and MATLAB and IDL front ends for, for user interfaces. So this was what I found when I arrived at the lab in 2005. So this is quite sophisticated, really. I mean, this example here shows we've measured the beam position at 10 or 12 places around the synchrotron and then done a calculation of how to vary many magnets to, to optimize that to keep the beam centered. So it's quite powerful, but it was very slow. I mean, this measurement took uh, 30 minutes at the time. So around the same time, Sarah joined uh, ISIS, uh, the ISIS diagnostics team. And uh, this is when we started to do lab view with ISIS. So uh, Sarah was given the, a few uh, early PXI chassis, which had been at the lab a couple of years, um, and inherited, um, you know, some kind of spaghetti VIs uh, in, written in LabVIEW 6, lots of nasty <laughs> groups and stuff. You kind of, you know, typical uh, newcomer to LabVIEW sort of thing. Um, so Sarah set about trying to build these into a comprehensive library that can do the beam data acquisition and analysis for ISIS. And you can see from this photo, she was immediately convinced this was going to work. It was a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> So then really through, yeah, over the last 10, 12 years, um, uh, LabVIEW has become the, the core of ISIS. You know, it's been quite a successful um, project. Um, I should point out, we have, you know, it wasn't just Sarah and I, it was help from several colleagues, not least our friend John Medland, who will be the next speaker here. But so to help with this task, Sarah set up a user group for the whole of the Rutherford Lab, um, also open to external visitors, which is still running today. And then on the back of that, we, um, 
she negotiated a, an enterprise agreement with NI, which gave us almost unlimited access to lovely licenses, all the toolkits, and also training and certification credits to, um, to develop you know, a programming team. So as I said, yeah, we uh, replaced a lot of the analog systems that we'd inherited, you know, these things that were built in the 80s or 90s, and, and LabVIEW started to take over our, our control room for the operators. So we invested a lot in NI over this period, but also they invested in us, it felt. Some of you may have been involved with the things like the NI Big Physics program they used to have. Um, so it seemed at this time they were very interested in talking to science uh, research facilities and using our requirements to push their, uh, you know, the capabilities of their hardware and software. Um, yeah, because we were, you know, high data throughput, uh, fast processing and for feedback systems. And weird things, I guess, like uh, we started to, as component sizes shrink, we started to see problems with uh, radiation damage. Um, had to move equipment further away from the accelerators and then install fiber optic links to do the communication. Something that's now a problem in like, aviation. It's becoming a bigger and bigger problem as, as components continue to shrink. So yeah, this was when we wrote to, you know, a paper at NI Days, and then Dr. T talked about us in his keynote speech, and this is paper <coughs> notice, Jeff K actually came and visited our lab at the time. <coughs> so I'll hand over to Sarah to give you a bit more up-to-date info. Okay, uh, so thanks, Brian. Um, so now you've got a bit of a history of accelerators, I'm going to go into a bit more detail and a, a case study of how we use LabVIEW and ISIS today. Uh, so here's an animation of the facility, and that's definitely the biggest screen I've ever seen that on. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're a pulse neutron source with a repetition rate of 50 hertz, and the second target station was added in 2008, and one-fifth of the pulses uh, produced by the synchrotron go to the second target station. So the acceleration process, which includes 12,000 revolutions of the synchrotron, happens in 10 milliseconds. And the rev revolution frequency in the synchrotron increases from 1 to 3 megahertz in this time. And by the time the beam reaches the target, it's reached 85% uh, of the speed of light. The target produces neutrons, which are directed to 30 different experimental stations, which all work in parallel, doing the material science studies that Brian mentioned earlier. So typically, we run about four to five user cycles a year, with maintenance in between. Each cycle is about 40 days in duration, during which time we have to operate 24-7. Um, it takes around 500 permanent staff to keep the facility running with an operating budget of about £70 million a year. So the data acquisition and software requirements of accelerators such as ISIS are very demanding due to the number of interacting complex systems and the rapidly changing beam dynamics. Uh, so as it's not possible to be near the accelerator when it's running due to the radiation and electrical hazards, everything is monitored in the control room, which is staffed 24-7 by the operators. Um, the data displayed in the control room comes mostly via three different channels. So the critical diagnostics are still hardwired and displayed on oscilloscopes or FPGA-based video displays, since this is very reliable. Uh, the second and most common channel is via the control system. And for the past 20 years, we've used a commercial system called Vista-V system. This is powerful, but it's relatively slow. Um, but this is sufficient for um, viewing and measuring standard equipment, for example, the power supplies and the water flows <coughs> and temperatures and for the slow monitoring of our diagnostics and the um, LabVIEW DAC systems interact with the control system via a web service. Uh, in the middle ground between these two options, uh, we have our LabVIEW-based GUIs. So these can process and display the data a lot faster than the control system, but are also much more customizable and interactive than the analog um, hardwired options. So in total, there's about two gigabytes a second acquired by the LabVIEW-based systems. And obviously, this can't 
all be sent over the network. So some of it's processed to summary data, which is displayed or stored in a database for offline analysis later. Um, so as an example, let's have a look at one of the most important diagnostics for an accelerator like ISIS, and that's how much beam is lost. So that acceleration process isn't perfect, and typically about five or on a bad day, 10% of the beam injected into the synchrotron doesn't reach the target. And there are special components inside the accelerator where this lost beam can be absorbed safely. However, if it were to be lost in the wrong place, it would soon become uh, impossible to operate the facility. So there's a couple of examples. Um, full beam loss onto steel would generate 100 degrees of heating per second and obviously very quickly cause components to melt. But also just 0.1% of the beam lost in the wrong place uh, for the entire user cycle would mean that that component would not be able to be safely um, maintained for months as it would have become radioactive. Um, so this means we need to monitor the beam loss constantly to ensure this doesn't happen. So throughout the facility, we have 81 three meter long argon filled ionization chambers and automatic interlocks would st will stop the beam if the loss measured by these monitors goes over a predetermined threshold. So this will prevent the immediate damage in the first example before. Um, but activation due to the low level um, loss has to be continually mod monitored. Um, so uh, the uh, levels can be optimized by the beam operators. Um, and if they can't optimize the beam, then the beam current has to be reduced. Uh, so to do this, we provide displays of the beam loss, uh, the distribution in time, so you can see the scope traces um, over here. That's the loss over the 10 milliseconds acceleration period. And um, in location, so these graphs show the beam losses in the LINAC, in the synchrotron, and to the two, the beam lines to the two targets. So this area of lost here, loss here is around the components <coughs> I mentioned earlier where the beam loss can be safely absorbed. Um, the average ISIS beam current over the past 40 years is shown in this graph. And you can see during the early noughties, it, it plateaued a bit. And this was actually due to um, a magnet magnet failures in the section next to this um, loss here um, due to beam loss damage to the equipment that the standard beam loss monitors couldn't see. So the solution to this um, was to add new, small, very sensitive magnet, uh, monitors inside the, the uh, magnets. Uh, these scintillators, which, reduce, which release photons when struck by ionizing radiation, can detect very small levels of beam loss not seen by the existing beam loss monitors, which you can see sit here outside the machine. And the scintillators are inserted actually <coughs> inside this magnet um, to detect the losses there. Um, initially, we prototyped 12 of these scintillators uh, inside the most problematic magnet, um, but now we have 64 di distributed around the full uh, 100 meters, 160 meter circumference of the synchrotron. A PXI chassis with four 6358 cards sits inside a shielded room in the center of the synchrotron with the cables routed underneath through tunnels, and then a fiber optic Mixi Express link connects that chassis um, to a rack-mounted controller in the control room 130 meters away. And this prevents that radiation damage to the controller and also allows easy access to it if necessary. Um, the scintillators are connected to photomultiplier tubes and each needs its own power supply set to around one kilovolt with the exact level determined by calibration. 
Um, so we have a multi-channel power supply situated in the same rack as the DAC chassis that provides this voltage. Uh, this was a good scientific solution, but it was also the first new diagnostic system which was fully developed from lab, with LabVIEW from the raw signal right to the user display. So this required a number of custom libraries to be developed. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is our multicast library. Um, so John actually did the first version of this when he was with us. Um, so initially we were using the LabVIEW shared variables to communicate between that real-time DAC chassis and the LabVIEW front ends. But we soon found this to be too unreliable because um, one of the benefits we wanted to realize was multiple users being able to view the data from multiple different locations at the same time. But what we found was the more connections you had to the shared variable, the slower the DAC chassis became, um, and uh, on occasion would just crash completely if there were too many connections. Uh, so we considered the network streams, which would have been efficient, but wouldn't have given us that one-to-many functionality that we required. So the multicast library was developed, and a multicast writer sits on the DAP controller and listens for connections. And when a new one is requested, a direct TCP channel is established between the DAC chassis and the LAVI front end. And this gave us the flexibility we wanted with the uh, reliability we needed. So uh, another library that um, was developed was our power supply server library. So our K and power supplies consist of up to 72 high channel, high voltage channels and um, its own embedded controller. This means, the high channel count means that one KN can uh, provide voltage for multiple different diagnostic systems, not just the scintillators, simultaneously. Um, we encountered a problem that the controller was limited in the number of simultaneous connections it could maintain. So this led to the development of the power supply server application. Um, so this software runs on a real-time controller and allows us to configure virtual power supplies, which are made up of any combination of channels from the physical power supplies. And then the client library can communicate with these virtual power supplies um, via the web um, from anywhere in the network. So to summarize the, the uh, beam loss example, um, these developments made the scintillators an excellent tool for the control room operators. By minimizing the signal on these scintillators, um, which was reduced, you can see in this graph, by a factor of around 10 in just three user cycles, uh, named here, um, uh, the, uh, what we actually found was there was a reduction in the total beam loss around the whole synchrotron of around 60%. And this reduction in beam loss meant that the beam intensity could actually be increased. And an increased beam intensity means more neutrons, and more neutrons means better science for the users. Um, so as well as the power supply and multicast libraries, we've built as much of the commonly used uh, code into libraries, which other members of the team can install via the JKI package manager. Um, the BMAPS menu was developed, and it's a central XE launcher and downloader, which allows easy access to all of our um, LabVIEW GUIs. Um, we also now conduct regular code reviews and have adopted GitLab as our uh, source code control. Um, I also developed what I hoped would become a standard framework for, for LabVIEW projects at ISIS, separating out all the different DAC and processing and, and error bits of the code for easier maintenance. However, what I found was the result was very similar to other openly available frameworks. Um, but obviously not as well developed or supported. So um, 
I think the next step is to take a look at some of these frameworks and, and maybe adopt them. Um, so overall, I'm happy with the ecosystem that we've built, and it's a far cry from when I started all those years ago and was handed that um, spaghetti code which ran on a Windows NT PXI and was accessed by a remote desktop. <laughs> However, there are challenges to maintaining this. So between our PXIs, Compact Rios, and Rat Mount controllers, we have about 25 real-time DAC systems. And there are security issues which make long-term support um, difficult. The main issue at the moment being the obsolete FARLAP operating system. So many of our PXIs still run on FARLAP, and also the Rat Mount controllers we use don't actually have a NI Linux real-time replacement. Um, also, the overhead of doing software updates um, can take up a lot of development time. There are now many um, cost-effective embedded controller options and open source platforms, which the graduates coming in to the department are more familiar, familiar with and tend to prefer. Um, and also, the ongoing maintenance costs um, even with the enterprise agreement, means it is difficult to justify to um, management um, these costs. And the, especially with the direct level of support that we get from NI being reduced recently. Um, also, the controls group at ISIS are at the beginning of a project. Uh, to transition our control system from V system to the more common open source epics. So uh, an upcoming challenge is to implement the LabVIEW communication to that. The controls group have made the decision to favor PV access over channel access. So if anyone has any experience of doing that with LabVIEW, I'd love to hear about it. Um, so. Just for a bit of a comparison, here's some of the details of the data acquisition and control requirements for ESS, where Brian is now. The requirements are very similar to ISIS, although the scale's larger. And it's quite different as they're literally starting from a green field. Um, and you may guess from the fact that the software is measured in lines of code, there's not much graphical programming happening here. So they have made the decision to favor open source platforms where possible, so Linux, Epix, MicroTCA, and their user applications are written in Python and Java. So to summarize, accelerators are awesome, but they're challenging um, for new and um, fully established uh, facilities. Uh, LabVIEW has meant that we can push the interaction with the diagnostic signals to the next level, and in turn improve the uh, beam performance and reliability, but it is challenging to keep it going. <laughs>